Hi! In this lecture, I'm going to continue the second part of inclusive education. So, I will be discussing to you the different roles of teachers and some strategies and tips for inclusive education and more topics about it. Now, our objective for this lecture is for you to gain insight on the importance of your role as an educator and of course for you to learn some strategies that you can use in an inclusive classroom. So just a quick review of what we have discussed in the first part of our lecture regarding inclusive education. Who are included again in an inclusive classroom? Can you remember? So as you can see in this um, chart, these are the um, children who are included or the scope actually of inclusive education. So um, a well thought out inclusive education program has the potential to meet the diverse educational needs of all children. So when we say all children, children with disabilities, children living in difficult circumstances, children with HIV and even other chronic illnesses, children with, or well, children of migrant laborers, even street children, children in remote tribal areas, and all other children. So schools should accommodate all children regardless of their physical, intellectual, social, linguistic, or other conditions in an inclusive classroom. So I hope that one is very clear to you. Now, based on some observations of some teachers in an inclusive classroom, the learners actually face some problems. So some of the problems that they observe is that some of the learners have inferiority complex. So it's kind of like, uh, it's actually it's a psychological thing. And in some ways they actually kind of feel deficient or inferior or lacking of something compared to others. Okay, in addition to that, some learners also in an inclusive classroom feel that they actually have lack of understanding or you can say lack of interest in or comprehension in a given subject or topic. Another problem that they face is the adjustment problem, probably because there are actually many factors, but what I'm just saying are some of the examples, probably because of the learner's environment at school or at home, which or the situation itself could be somewhat stressful to the learner, right? And another thing, uh, another problem that they face is the feeling of um, being isolated or segregated. Again, probably because of some factors such as their own differences from the others. Okay, another problem also that they face is the some of them lag behind in the classroom. Why do you think do they lag behind? Probably because they are uninterested, they could probably be bored, or they could probably still be struggling at school, and also other reasons. And um, the worst actually is the feeling that they are actually an extra burden to the other people around them, such as their classmates or their teacher. Maybe probably because they couldn't understand their own efforts and struggles, right? Insecurity is also one of their problem, probably because of some of the traumas that they have, they had in the past, okay, and some traumas or experiences they had in their community, at home, or even in their own society. You know, many things which can could contribute to the insecurity of the learner. 
Next one is shyness. Maybe because of the learner's lack of experience or probably the learner was not exposed that much or was not allowed that much to do many things. So it's also quite, um, could be some of the factors on why they also feel introvert. So these are just some of the problems that some of the learners in an inclusive classroom face. Therefore, as a teacher, we actually have a crucial role inside the classroom. So the teacher should have actually, you know, the ability to solve problems and even take the advantage of children's individual interests and, of course, use their internal motivation for developing needed skills for the educator herself and, of course, for the learner. Okay, so what we have here are just some of the roles of teachers in an inclusive education classroom. The first role is for them to identify the children, if possible, with disabilities in the classroom. Now, if they are able to identify these children with disabilities, they should refer them to the experts for further examination and treatment because it's actually very helpful for the educator herself to know about it so that the um, educator will know how to handle that student in the future. Uh, third role of the teacher is accepting the children with disabilities. As I have mentioned earlier, in inclusive education, all of the children are included in the classroom, regardless of many factors. Next one, developing positive attitude between normal and disabled children. And another role of the teacher is for them to place the children in the classroom in proper places so that they can feel comfortable and are benefited by the classroom interaction. So it's up to them. They, can, they could place them in front or the side so that it would be easier for them to move inside the classroom. This is connected with the role of the teacher in number six. They should remove some architectural barriers wherever possible so that the children with disabilities can move independently. So the role of the teacher also is to plan how she can actually make the learners sit together or plan the seating arrangement of the children so that it would also be easier for the children with disability to move freely inside the classroom. Now, a very important role of a teacher is to involve the children in almost all of the activities in the classroom because it could actually um, be very helpful for them to learn more about the activity. Making suitable adaptation in the curriculum transaction so that the children with disabilities can also learn according to their ability. And of course, the preparations of teaching aids or adaptation of teaching aids, which will help the children with disabilities, should be, of course, be very much prepared. So aside from those roles of the teacher, another role of the teacher is parental guidance and counseling. And of course, public awareness program through the school activities that they actually give in the school. And another thing, okay, that I would like to tell you, an inclusive teacher doesn't work alone. They should collaborate or work together with medicals or physiological panels or experts social workers, and even parents and special teachers. Of course, with the kind of job that they have inside the classroom, it would be very much, uh, very difficult for them to do everything on their own. Collaborating or working together with the other experts would be a very big help for them to answer some of the problems that he or she could encounter with her or his students. Next one, 
The, it's the role of the teacher to construct achievement and diagnostic tool for their learner and an adaptation and evaluation for children with special needs. And of course, it's also the role of the teacher to provide remedial instruction to the children who actually require it. So um, as you know, the teacher's role is actually to create a community which is conducive to helping all of the students in the classroom so that they can actually have a better learning and so that they can achieve their goal. However, of course, as I have told you earlier, she does not have to achieve this aim alone. She has to work together or cooperate or collaborate with other experts or teachers. Ongoing communication, of course, is very essential for locating individual services and materials to best support all of the students. So what you have just listened are just some of the roles that a teacher should have in an inclusive education classroom. Now, the next one that I'm going to talk about is about some strategies that we can use for inclusive teaching and learning based on observation and based on research by some of IE educators. So one of the things that they actually recommended or suggested is to include diverse content materials and ideas. You see, even in an inclusive classroom, the concept or ideology of multicultural education and teaching to diversity is also included, is a part of inclusive education. Now, whenever you prepare lectures or classes or lessons, questions for discussions or even scenarios, case studies, and examples, it should, of course, reflect the human diversity. So it's also one of the concepts that are ideas that actually we learn in teaching to diversity, right? Okay, another reason, one reason why we also need to include this kind of materials is it could help the students understand the knowledge which is often produced through conversation and collaboration among different points of view. Now, whenever possible, the educator should select topics and materials that reflect the contributions and perspectives from groups that have been historically underrepresented in the field. So this is also reflected in Bang's uh, multicultural dimension and it's also added in the levels of integration that I have discussed under the lecture of multicultural education. So the concepts are actually interrelated and are connected with each other, right? Now in an inclusive classroom, another strategy is to create, of course, an inclusive environment. Now, when talking with students during class, we should try to communicate clearly, of course. On the first day of the class, we should already tell them the, their own expectations on what could probably happen or what could happen in the classroom, including, of course, your expectation as a teacher in order for them to have a respectful and inclusive interaction. Now, we should set and enforce ground rules in the beginning so that we can have a very polite or respectful interaction in the classroom such as guidelines for contributing ideas and questions for responding respectfully to the ideas and questions of the other learners inside the inclusive classroom. Another thing is as, um, as an educator in an inclusive classroom, we should get to know our students and of course their individual perspectives, their skills, their experiences, and even the ideas that they bring into your course. To that extent, if possible, we should 
Uh, of course, know our students individually, but of course, it depends on the size of your class. But as much as possible, we should know our students individually wholeheartedly so that we can easily understand them in handling them in an inclusive classroom. Next one, another strategy is to show respect for all questions and comments, okay? As an educator, we should use verbal and nonverbal cues to encourage the participation and to challenge the students to think deeply and critically about the subject matter or topic being discussed in the classroom. So I think this strategy is quite easy to follow, right? Now, another strategy that they recommend is to encourage growth mindset. So we're going to have actually um, a separate lecture about growth and fixed mindset. So I hope you will watch that one for you to change your mindset, okay? So we actually, as an educator, should foster a growth mindset by conveying the idea that intelligence is not a reflection of fixed natural abilities, but can change and grow over time. So whenever we talk with students about their performance in class or on exams or assignments, if possible, we should um, avoid describing such performance as a sign of natural ability or lack of ability. Why? Because if we keep on doing that, if we keep on, you know, there showing them or telling them their lack of ability, it could probably activate stereotyping inside the classroom, right? Another thing is we should create an environment in the classroom or laboratory in which it is okay to make mistakes and where faltering can lead to deeper learning. You know, if your students actually contributed an answer which is incorrect, okay, we can actually ask questions to help the students identify how he or she arrived at that answer. And of course, to help the entire class to understand at least one method to derive the correct answer. So from that mistake that the learner had, he, could, he or she could actually learn from his own mistake and think and analyze critically why his answer is wrong so that he can realize that, ah, oh, okay, it's wrong because, okay, so he can reason out why and actually he can learn more in that process. Okay, another one, we should be open to the possibility that what seems to be an incorrect answer initially may actually lead to shared understanding of an alternative way to answer the question of or given by the teacher, right? Okay, the um, inclusive education teachers recommended also the next strategy, which is to strive for equality of access to instruction and assistance. So promoting fairness and transparency by sharing the criteria that you will use to evaluate their work with students is actually very, very important. When appropriate, grade with rubrics or answer keys so that they can understand why their score is like that and they're not going to compare their own score with their um, peers' score. So with your transparent and very clear feedback, comment or score or rubric, they can have an understanding on why their score is high or low or in the middle, right? So that's the reason why uh, creating rubric is very important for us teachers. Next, we should ensure that assistance provided outside of class is equally available and accessible, of course, to everyone. So we should share to our students some information that they can use for their classes just, just in case they have some homework 
or just in case they have some problem, at least they should know where to go, what to do, and where to research, those kinds of things. So we should not only share that kind of information to only one or even a small group, but to all of our students. Okay, so this is the final strategy that is recommended for an inclusive classroom. That is to gather and use feedback to refine and of course, refine, uh, improve your strategies. First thing, I really like this, is to ask a colleague or staff member to observe your teaching. Good teachers actually always ask help from their peers or their colleagues. They ask feedback, they ask them to observe them, and then they ask feedback from them and evaluate their own teaching. Now, we can also actually do this with our students. Provide, provide opportunities for students to reflect on the course and to give you feedback on the methods and strategies that you are using. This is actually um, very efficient and helpful for the teacher to improve more um, himself as an educator and to change or refine the methods or strategies that he used inside the classroom if it's very helpful or not. Therefore, probably he can adjust or do something about it, right? Now, as you build your teaching experience or expertise, the teacher should practice a growth mindset. We should be open to various possibilities of learning from mistakes and welcome, of course, the opportunity to learn as much as we can from our diverse students. So we should identify these kinds of things so that we can become an efficient, inclusive education educator. So just a summary, okay, just a review. These are the strategies for inclusive teaching and learning. First one is for you to include diverse content and materials and ideas in your class. And secondly, for you to create an inclusive environment Thirdly, for you as an educator to encourage growth mindset and to strive for equality of access to instruction and, of course, assistance. And lastly, gather and use feedback to refine and, of course, improve your strategies. So these are just some of the things that we can use. And as you can see, these are also some tips, okay, or effective teaching practices for inclusive classroom, again, based on some researches that I have gathered. So one of the tips that they said when it comes to planning, of course, your class is for you to collaborate with special education teachers, related service providers, and paraprofessionals on a regular basis. Um, and earlier, I mentioned that as an IE teacher, we should work together with the other experts or the other professionals because we cannot actually do everything in the classroom on our own, right? We cannot actually attain our goal without working with the others. Okay. Another tip for planning is to use a variety of co-teaching method. I like this, okay? Usually in our GTU, uh, GTU programs, Team teaching or co-teaching is always a part of our program. So they actually experience this one many times, most especially when they go to the community to teach Filipino children. So in using co-teaching method, there are actually four, four kinds of co-teaching method. The first one is interactive teaching, wherein the teachers alternate roles of presenting, reviewing, and even monitoring the instruction inside the classroom, right? Another method could be the usage of the alternative teaching, where one of the teacher teaches, reteaches, or enriches a concept for a small group, while the other monitor or teaches the remaining students. So you can also do this kind of method, right? Thirdly is parallel teaching, okay? 
So one teacher here, one teacher here. So students are divided into mixed ability groups and each co-teaching partner teaches the same material to one of the groups. This is actually a very common method that the GTU students do in the community service because not all of the children have the same level and understanding. So what they do is that they teach it as a whole and then later on they do parallel teaching again. Okay, so two of them are teaching, two is to two. So one teacher is to two, one teacher is to two students teaching the same subject matter, the same topic. Another co-teaching method is the station teaching. This is commonly used also in some schools where small groups of students rotate to various stations for instruction, review, and or practice. So one table is for instruction, one table is for review, another table is for practice. So they're just rotating. They actually do this one in some uh, classrooms I saw in America. And this is actually possible and based on their observation is actually very helpful. Now, some tips for structuring your lessons. We should differentiate instruction by using flexible grouping if possible. We should provide activities that appeal to various learning style preferences, giving them student choices, and creating alternative activities and assessment. Second one, whenever we structure our lesson, we should think universal design when planning, planning instruction. The universal design is a separate lecture, so you can watch it and learn from it on how you can apply that one in, a, in an inclusive classroom and even a diverse classroom, right? Okay, so thirdly, we should provide opportunities for students to work in small groups and of course, in pairs. And fourthly, we can actually use graphic organizers to assist our students with um, organizing the information in meaningful ways. There are different kinds of graphic organizers that we can use, and they can actually use that one for note-taking, for instance. Now, to ensure success for students in an inclusive classroom, teachers must plan collaboratively. I keep on saying again and again, we should collaborate with teachers and we should create structured classroom with very clear rules and expectations and teach content in meaningful and memorable way. Though there are many barriers that we could probably have in an inclusive classroom, such as the following, okay, resources, physical barriers, teachers, or funding even, these are just some actually of the barriers that some inclusive education schools have experienced. But, you know, despite the benefits that um, IE actually has, these barriers are still many. And there are still many struggles that they actually face. So barriers when it comes to the funding of resources, you know, and then physical barriers such as the schools itself, teachers who are not trained or who are unwilling to be trained in teaching in an inclusive classroom, the curriculum which is actually very rigid and does not allow experimentation or changes. Uh, another barrier could also be, of course, the leadership in the school, okay? The professional development where the teachers lack training, of course attitudes and beliefs, and unwillingness to embrace a philosophy of inclusion or to change existing practices. It could also be standardized assessments or even organization. There are actually many barriers, of course. So with these barriers that we have, overcoming this one, okay, oh, overcoming these barriers to inclusive education for sure, of course, is difficult but even more importantly of course it requires the change of old and outdated attitudes studies support what many class studies support what many classroom teachers know by experience 
that the benefits inclusion provides to all students easily justifies the effort. Okay, I'll repeat. I would like to emphasize that one. Studies support what many classroom teachers know by experiences that the benefits inclusion provides to all students easily justifies their efforts. So that's all. That's all about inclusive education. I hope you learned many things about it so that in the future, if you're going to teach in this kind of classroom, it's easier for you to adjust and understand the culture inside that classroom.